right so so far we discussed the small signal model and uh, basically how it looks like is something like this we have uh, the gate the source the drain and uh, the first most important thing is the gm so depending on the voltage between the gate and source i conduct a current which is gm times vgs okay so if you want to use <coughs> hand calculations so if you want to do some hand calculation if you want to make a very approximate analysis this model is good enough it will give you some idea of what from okay then next feature is you add the slope on the so this is assuming that the slope is zero so this is the id vds line so this model assumes that the slope is zero the slope here is zero right it's not really zero so you add the next element the next element is a resistor between the drain and the source so we call it rds then of course you might want to take into account the effect of the body of the device okay i have not even drawn it in this model so i incorporate another terminal called the body and uh, from the body to source that voltage will give me yet another current right so i'm going to get another element over here your device sorry this is the gate this is the source this is the drain and this is the body right so on one side there is the gate on the top there is the gate on the bottom there is the body both are going to affect the quality of the channel so if you if you uh, use the knob for the gate and attract electrons into the channel then you've got a connection between gate and source uh, sorry drain and source likewise if you use the handle in the body you can also do something with it okay you can use the handle in the body to control the channel you can use the handle in the gate to control the same channel which is closer to the channel the gate is closer to the channel so the effect of the gate on the channel is much much higher than the effect of the body on the channel okay a typical thumb rule is that this much much greater number anyone has any idea how how much greater no okay so the typical thumb rule is that uh, the effect of the body on the channel is three times less than less than the effect of the gate on the channel okay so once you do the analysis properly etc etc you find out that gmb is probably one third of gm roughly how much okay so front gate back gate the back gate is one third as effective as the front gate 
all right now this is as far as the dc model goes this all this is at dc frequency is zero or close to zero okay the small signal that you have applied may or may not be a sinusoid it could be a sinusoid it could be a dc voltage but it's got to be of low frequency content okay now we start adding in the high frequency components the high frequency component number 1 one, one and two most important ones are the oxide capacitors so they give me a cap between cg uh, g and s and a cap between g and d okay typically if uh, if you are uh, using the uh, if you are using a large amount of vds vds is large v drain to source is large then what's going to be cgd compared to cgs much much lesser cgd is 1/3 of sorry not 1/3 1/2 1 of cgs then it is just pinched off okay as you progress it becomes smaller 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 if vds is really large then cgd is going to be much much smaller than it is got it okay if drain source voltage is zero then they will be equal cgs will be equal to cd because the channel will be uniform fine so at pinch off this is 2 2 by 3 c ox at pinch off this is 1 by 3 c ox and as you go for higher and higher vdss this ratio becomes more and more the c is to one ratio becomes more and more the sum does it change mm -hmm. the total does not change okay. now on top of this there is overlap capacitance so this is something that can be changed when you change the different bias conditions voltages etc etc you can modify these capacitors if you really cannot tolerate any cgd then you really jack up the voltage over there and you can reduce cgd right but on top of this there is something called overlap capacitance this is intrinsic okay no matter what you do with the voltages you can't change these capacitors because they are there because of the shapes the physical dimensions etc etc so we are going to call it cov all right so these are the gate to source and gate to drain capacitors now because of the junctions between drain and body and between source and body there exist two other capacitors so these are junctions so i'm going to call them cj okay and this junction capacitance depends on the area of the drain the area of the source the perimeter of the drain the perimeter of the source what else does it depend on doping concentration yes of course what else does it depend on depth of the source and drain junctions what else bias conditions so if i make dvs large what's going to happen If I make V B S large, <laughs> 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 what 
biased, right? So the plates will become closer. So the capacitance will actually increase if I make BBS large. If I make BBS negative, then capacitance will become lesser and lesser as BBS becomes lesser and lesser. Okay, same with body to drain. Agreed? Okay. So I'm going to call them CJ, C junction. Okay, there are different. Uh, uh, they call it CJSW in Spectre, in Spice. It's called CJSW. Side wall. Depends on the water. Uh, depends on the. So if drain voltage is more than the source voltage, then VBS will be larger than VBB. Yes. So because VBS is larger than VBB, the capacitance between body and source will be more than the capacitance between body and source. What else is there? We mentioned the uh, uh, gate to body capacitance in the last class. This capacitance is really very, very small and it's important only when the channel is not there or very de uh, there very weakly. Okay, when all the uh, majority carriers haven't been pushed out of the body. Okay, that's when this capacitance is important. Otherwise, you need not worry about. Is there a capacitance between drain and source? No. Okay? So don't worry about the capacitance between drain and source. They are really far apart. Alright. Anything else? Okay. Fantastic. So, Suppose I am making a PMOS, not an NMOS. First of all, what is different about this model? No, there is no, no difference. The model remains identical. Okay? Don't get this confused. Current source doesn't change direction, nothing changes. This model is what it is. This is the last word. So this model is irrespective of whether it's an NMOS or PMOS. All right. So first of all, let's get that. Let's get that out of the way. Now, how? Yes. No, nothing is. Different. Your absolute voltages are different. That's the end of the story. Vs is now more than Vg. Absolute in terms of absolute voltage, the bias condition will adjust. So your large signal equations will change, the small signal equations will not change. They will then identify. Okay, so how you make a PMOS? You have a P substrate, right? you would like to have the source and drain to be made out of P material and you would like the body to be made out of N material. So first of all you make a well. You make an N well and then inside the N well Okay. 
So So what do you have between body and self? You have a diffusion region between body and self. Hopefully you have reverse bias. Huh? Hopefully, yes. Hopefully you haven't goofed up and it's reverse bias. Right? So in that case, there is going to be some diffusion region and there is going to be a capacitor. Okay. Anything else that we are missing out? think about it it's let's say we have an nmos back to nmos huh? so the channel is made out of made up of three electrons okay and these are moving at a high velocity assuming that you have applied these gates so Let's say this is uh, so. If you have applied high uh, high a large voltage between drain and source, then the electrons are moving at a great speed from source to drain. Right? What does this uh, kind of tell you? Okay, finite transit time. Inductive effect. Minus, right? Huh. So, this, so what, as soon as you remove the drain and source voltages, it takes a little bit of time for the electrons to stop. Okay, the electrons need a little bit of time to slow down and come to the right, come to the right desired speed. Okay, suppose you want the electrons to stop suddenly. You are moving in a fast car. Okay, suddenly you see a red light. You need to stop. You need to brake. It takes time. It's not instantaneous. Okay. So, inductance is the property. What is inductance? The, the, the current is conserved, right? You can't make dramatic changes in the current all of a sudden. The same thing. Okay? You can't suddenly say, stop now. Right? So, that's what's going to happen. Between the drain and source, you'll see a tiny amount of inductance. Because the electrons are moving at a high velocity. Okay? So this you will see as you go higher and higher up in frequency. Okay, which is the norm. Will you also see a small amount of resistance between the electrons? You should, right? It's a it's a it's like a wire. So you will see a resistance, you will see an inductance between drain and source. Now, the resistance I have already indicated as RDS is already some kind of a resistor between drain and source. You are going to see 
and inductor small inductance Now, the way I have described things, all of these things start appearing as you want to become more and more accurate and as you want to do your analysis at higher and higher frequencies. Okay, we started from the basic GM, that's vital. Without the GM, there's no transistor. Then we said we need an RDS. Then we said we need to take care of the body. Then we said we need to take care of the uh, capacitors, the parasitic capacitors, the different different ones. I started from the most important and then proceeded. And now finally we have come to this inductor. <laughs> okay. So all these things you have to take care of as you go towards higher and higher frequencies of operation of the mass. Anything else that we are missing out? There are some important things that we are missing. If I have a gate, this is all made out of polysilicon and I have touched the center point of this with a wire, with a metal wire. Are 
really not driving. Uh, so if you're talking about DC, the gate resistance is immaterial. You can have huge resistance over there, no problem. Okay, this need not be a conductor at all. It can be insulating material. If you're talking about DC, but overall, what we are doing is we are driving a capacitor. Okay, some sort of a capacitor. So there is a top plate, there is a bottom plate, etc., etc. You can think of it this: way. there is a top plate and there is a bottom. Plate. So you are driving a capacitor. Now this capacitor needs to be charged up. Okay, if you have resistance on the metal wire, then you will get an RC time constant. Okay, but you don't have resistance on the metal wire. But at the center point, the voltage, I mean, it's a very good connection at the center point. The sheet resistance. Yes, but is it a linear effect, or will you be getting some kind of an RC out of it, or what will you be getting? How will you compute that R? Uh, the width? Let's say depth, huh? No, no, you you are not getting the problem. The way I am posing it. So suppose I suddenly change the voltage on this metal wire from V1 to V2 from 0 volts to 1 volt. The center point where it is touching the gate, there there is going to be an instantaneous volt. That is also on the policy <coughs> effect. There is going to be an instantaneous change of voltage from V1 to V2. Fine. What is your name? Akhil says that to distribute the voltage, usually distributing a voltage or distributing uh, charge. charge. Uh, you are distributing charge. So distributing the charge will take a little bit of time. At that center point, you have got the right charge already. Okay. As you go to different, different radii, it is taking more and more time to Get the, uh, to arrive at the right amount of charge. Okay? How are you going to model this? Or how are you going to compute the effective resistance of the gate? No? It is a distributed network. Do you remember this doing um, remember studying some kind of a problem like this, infinite grid, infinite mesh of resistors of the same value. Long time back, maybe in class 12 or yeah? Might remember. Something like this. You remember? So this is effectively something like this. Okay? It's a massive mesh of these resistors. <laughs> And you are changing the voltage at this point, at the center point. 
okay and beneath this beneath every cross point there is a small little capacitor <coughs> okay to the channel underneath every cross point there is a small capacitor to the channel This is now 3D. So you can do this problem at home. Analyze it and tell me what you get. Okay. What do you want to So you assume that uh, the sheet resistance is rho. Okay, assume that the device has a width of W, a length of L. What I need to know is, uh, can you come up with an expression for the effective resistance? Oh, also assume that this capacitance is total capacitance is C. Yeah. So total capacitance is C ox. Okay. Capacitance per unit area is C ox divided by W divided by L. Right. That's the total capacitance. The sheet resistance is rho. Okay. What I need to know is what is the effective So the effective R you will get from the effective RC time constant. Mm -hmm. so you will get an RC time constant overall, huh? and from that RC time constant you divide the time constant by C. You are going to get the R. Huh. Divided by C ox, you will get. It. So that's the parameter that I am interested. In. Okay, just try this out. So that will give you some resistance on the gate. Okay, it's a distributed resistance. You have to understand. What else is there? At each of these contact points, you are going to get the contact resistance. Okay. So the gate resistance is not because of the contact. The gate resistance is more because of the poly. The polysilicon sheet resistance. Okay, and then at each of the other contact points, the drain, source, body, substrate, whatever you have, you will get small, small resistors, which are basically the contact resistors. Fine. So this is my more or less. You can I can go on and on with this, mm -hmm. but this is my small signal model. Okay, this is the model which I'm going to use at very very high frequency. If you are designing an LNA, don't know exactly why. You have to use a complete model. If you are making some uh, oscillator working at uh, you know some L gigahertz, then you have to use all this. If you are designing some extremely high frequency filters, I don't know. Okay, this is the model we use. If you are designing an op-amp that works at audio frequencies, what do you use? Okay, most probably you use not all the capacitors also. Okay, you get rid of everything. You just have the GM and the RDS. Okay, actually you might need a couple of capacitors. All right. Now, so we have studied more or less. We know how the MOSFET works. Okay. It's 
small signal models we know. Now suppose uh, day after tomorrow some a new device starts being used. Will you be able to use it? We, have, we are not going to teach you the new device. But will you be able to use it? Knowing what you know right now? Hopefully you will be able to use it. That's the intention. Okay? That whatever the device is, you look at the DC characteristics, you analyze it a little bit, you study it a little bit, and you figure out how it works, and then you can create a small signal model for that device by yourself, all by yourself. You need no help. Okay? That's the intention. So, tomorrow's devices, carbon nanotubes, uh, this, that, you know, fin fats. We are not going to teach all this, but with this background, you should be able to use them in regular circuits. Okay? I consider this background sufficient. Also, yesterday's devices, for example, bipolar junction transistors, for example, uh, cathode ray tubes. Okay. Everything is covered. Okay. Now, what's the goal of this course? Did I say? Mention op amp design. That's the single most important mm -hmm. goal of this course. We should not lose sight of this goal. Now, to proceed with this, the first thing I want you to, I want to talk about, how much time do we have? So we'll talk about uh, uh, balance and unbalanced circuits first. So consider this. We have a black box. And you are told that inside the black box there are a lot of devices. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, transformers, <coughs> linear devices. Okay, all of these devices are linear. I am not yet invoking MOSFETs here. Right? And you are given a second black box which has the same devices arranged in a mirror fashion. Okay, so whatever you have in this first black box the second black box is a mirror replica of the first one. Alright? And you know, you have uh, inputs, I mean wires coming out of this black box, several wires coming out of this black box. Some of them get connected to each other. they don't get connected to each other, you connect them to the same thing. Same. <coughs> so let's say I connect this to ground, this I connect to ground, this I connect to the power supply, this I connect to the power supply. And I still have uh, two wires left, one on this side, the other on the other side. This one I connect to plus V and the other I connect to minus V. What can you tell me about the wires, the condition of the wires in between? So what can you tell me about these wires? <coughs> can you tell me anything about these wires? Zero volts. All of these wires will be at zero volts. Why? By symmetry. Okay? 
you're basically thinking of a seesaw over here, right? This is some kind of a seesaw. Those are the pulsar points. Okay, just completely by symmetry, without doing any kind of circuit analysis. You forget everything. Huh? Based on your class 10 experience, not even class 10 experience, maybe your class 1 experience, you have played on a seesaw. Based on that experience, you are telling me that the wires in between are at zero volts. Okay? No other analysis is required. I am not going to try to prove this using conventional data. It is easy to prove it, but I am not going to try. How do you prove it? With superposition. Okay? If plus B causes so much and that, and minus B over there will cause the negative of that over there. So the net result is the sum of the two, which is zero. Okay? Let's not attempt to prove it. It's easy. I have already proved. All of those voltages are exactly pinned at zero volts. They are pinned at zero volts. They are not going to move. As long as this relationship plus V and minus V is maintained. Okay? What if What if I change this to plus V? So what if now I apply plus V on one side and plus V on the other side? What can you say about the wires in between? Okay, Manos is giving me the right answer. So the current moving from one side to the other through these wires are all identically going to be equal to zero. Any reason why? No potential difference. That's not any No potential difference between these two points. There is a current. So that can't be the reason. Huh? What is the magnitude? Some magnitude. I don't know. They're equal. That's all I'm telling you. Equal amounts of current. Thank you. So if, if you again think about superposition, remove that voltage, make it zero. This voltage is creating a current of I that way. When you null this, you apply voltage there. That voltage is also creating a current of I in the opposite way. So the two are going to add up. As a result, you are going to get zero current to these wires. Now, these two relationships came up only because of symmetry. Okay, that's the only property we have used. We have used very little other knowledge of circuits. One more property that we have used. Linear elements. The boxes should contain linear elements. Okay? Okay, now our circuits are not going to be like this. We'll have our circuits made up of MOSFETs. So what's the leap that we need to make? Small signal model is linear. Fantastic. 
So? So the hypothesis works if we are working with small signals. Okay. So this capital V that I have written can't be a capital V anymore. It has to be a small V. Everyone agrees? So if I introduce MOSFETs or any other non-linear <laughs> elements in this, any non-linear element, put DJPs, no problem. It will still have a small signal model. Put diodes, they will still have a small signal model. Right? And in the small signal sense, these two, uh, not even hypotheses, they are like proofs. Identity, no, not identity. Yeah. Theorems. <laughs> These two theorems are still valid in the small signal sense. So if I now say that I'm not going to make a plus V over here, still correct. What does this mean? Is this the absolute magnitude of the voltage? This is the small signal component of the voltage. Similarly, this is the small signal component of the current. So there could be a bias current. On top of that, the small signal current will be at this. Okay, so we'll um, take off from this point in the next class. Let's so still, yes. Uh, uh, you have to design both. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and. Uh,